What now? I've got to Okay, you're ready. Right, 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 relax, relax. So, Alan Franklin, the man, the myth, the legend. I want to go back with every great story. We start at the beginning. How did you get into motorbikes, mate? Uh, I got into motorbikes through my brother. And my father had a market garden. That was what I did. And he bought a little old army bike and I converted that into a motocross bike as such. And I never stopped after that really. I worked for my dad for a few years till they sold the garden and then I went and worked for John Hinton with my apprenticeship in Honey Hanger and race bikes all through that period as well. How much was your first bike, can you remember? My first bike that I brought was a hundred pounds. There was a lot of money then? It was a lot of money, but I did something else when I was really young, teenager. I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning, go and work for my dad, pulling salary, getting it ready for the markets, mm -hmm. and then I'd go home at sort of half past seven, have breakfast and then go to school. And I did that for quite a lot of years. And actually when I left school, I had 400 pounds in my bank account, which bought me, which was the cost of a Norton SS 650 Norton, which is the best motorcycle I could buy. So I bought a little matchless first, and then I bought my Norton SS. Wow. My father would never sign an HP, so we had that cash for everything. And that's how I started, but I road raced my Norton at Pookie when I was 15 years old. Awesome. Were you one of the youngest on the track? Yeah, I was probably. Won those production races at 15. So, yeah, and then I went and then I built a motocross bike then. Well, Scrambler in them days. Um, which I found at the Waikawai tip was a Ballaset case TT, KTT, and I converted all that into an aerial frame with the help of my boss, John Newman, who was a very, very good rider, one of the best in New Zealand, and built that and had a lot of success on that really. And then I got into, then I got proper factory um, bikes. And I rode for Laurie Summers, which was, he was a Kawasaki and CZ agent. And um, I rode for him for years. When did you find out you had a gift for doing oh, mechanical work? My brother was quite a good rider, but never did it competitively. Yeah, both my brothers really. I just, yeah really enjoyed it. Did it all on my own. Parents didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just did it all, you know, and had met some fantastic people. Went to Australia and the usual motocross team. Me and Ross McLaren and Alan Collinson. And yeah, and just went from there really. You touched earlier in the week when we were talking about um, uh, a friend of mine having to rebuild some spokes on his wheels and you touched on your apprenticeship. You used to build the wheels back in those days and the amount of effort, time, and I suppose, technical expertise. Do you see that now with the with the younger ones coming through? No, but you gotta remember everything's changed so much, you know. It's, um, I mean, the everything's, uh, everything's mag wheels, you know, and very few spokes. It made across, of course, just people still do it. It's, it's not actually hard to do, but there's not a lot of people that do it. Yeah, things were a lot different. You fixed everything, you didn't. You had to fix everything, it was very expensive mm. in the early days. You couldn't just put your parts in it. So yeah, it was, it was really good time really. Yeah, it was. 70s, um, you know, you've touched 70s. a little bit around the racing and what have you. How did you end up in, the, um, in, a, in a dealership, you know? Um, well, what happened a little bit there was I, when I finished my time with motorcycles, a very good friend of mine, John Wise, he was a motor, motor car mechanic and we opened a little business in Only Hunger, car mechanic in which I enjoyed. And then um, I got in, involved with Jeff Perry. I married Jeff's sister and Jeff was the best rider New Zealand ever had and probably one of the nicest people you ever meet. And so <clears throat> I, John wanted to go different directions and we sold our little business and then I went and worked for Lynn Perry. And 
the idea of that was that Len was going to retire and Jeff and I was going to take over the motorcycle business. Um, so then I got involved, I was still racing uh, across, but I got involved with Jess bikes and the mechanical side of it a lot. And we had great success. We went to Singapore and Malaysia and won every Grand Prix there was up there. Jeff was riding sort of factory bikes at that stage, Suzuki's. And also it was very successful in America. And he'd just signed a contract with Suzuki to ride MotoGP with the new RG500 square for that build. What year? Um, yeah, I'm terrible on the years. Okay. It's late 70s. Yep. 70s. Late 70s. Um, no, no, early 70s, sorry, yeah. And he'd been doing the AMA in America road racing, one Atlantic and one Ontario. And he was going back to do another meeting. And I nearly went back with him, me and his wife, but he had to get back quickly because he had an exam in New Zealand. And anyway, he left and that was the last we seen of him. He got killed in the plane crash in Bangalore. So then Lean really that buggered things a little bit regards you think so mm. um Len was said oh need to be out of here and then Bob Coleman come to me and they'd been not they didn't want to but they'd been landed with this retail business here. So he came to me and said what I run a workshop, which I did. How old were you? Um Mm, and, uh, and um, which we did was huge. Sydney's was unbelievable. I had, I had 12 mechanics down here. We just went on day. The shop was a bit bigger then. It was the whole building was the shop. Wow. The whole building. All this where our showroom now is was a workshop. The whole floor was a workshop. So it was unbelievably huge that we sold right in the early 70s. Later 70s, they were selling 44,000 a year motorcycles a year. Now we sell 4,000 a year. What drove that sort of sales number? Was it um, no, because you couldn't buy cars? All so cars, probably for the viewers, you want to explain that that you had to have English pounds. Yeah, you had to have English pounds and, and you know import licenses and very dear to buy a new car. Mm. So and of course, in second-hand cars were very expensive as well. And it wasn't a lot, so bikes was the only means of transport really. You know. And then it was like a light switch, so turn that off. When Japanese imports was allowed in, it just completely stopped it overnight. It was unbelievable, you couldn't believe it, mm. how it stopped it. You know. So everything downsized. Then Coleman's, they didn't really want to retail because they were importers. They sold it to a South African family. Okay. which I carried on working for, but they had no passion for it, and it just went downhill. And then I bought it off them. What year? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a bit blurry, eh, hey, your cobwebs? Yeah, no coffee. Yeah. Oh, sorry, here you go. Okay, here's Alan's coffee. Yep, good. I don't know why. Uh, when, did I, when did I take over at Alston? Um, Was it that? 90-something, 90, Yeah. Yeah. 94, so you'd actually been here for... I've been, here. yeah, well I, this year I think it's my 44th year. Wow. In this building, same day. You've seen a lot of change in that time, Alan? Well, I have, but it's not, not great, you know, I mean, nothing, it's like you mean, same day, <laughs> different shit, you yeah. know, and it, it, it's, it doesn't, it hasn't changed. I mean, the biggest change, I guess, is the technical advance on motorcycles and cars, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things was, you know, the material they built them out have become better and better and better and better, so they last forever and they could do anything, you know. So all that is the biggest change, but basics are still the same. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing's changed. The race motor, cam timing in the 60s is very similar to today, you know, and all those things, those bases never change that much, quite interesting. With all the wealth of knowledge that you've picked up over the many years, you know, you've had a lot of different guys come through your workshop and work for you. 
What are some of the traits or the talents that you look for for the younger people today if they're getting into this game? Uh, I think the biggest thing, really, you got to have the world to learn, you know, and, and I think motorcycling is definitely a passion. If it, because <laughs> it's, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's just, if you haven't got a passion, it doesn't mean that much, you know. Because it, really it was the cheapest form of transport you could get, and that's what people had to use. And then it built where people really started to enjoy that side of it, and it got, you know, better on the sports side of it. So, yeah, it was, I, I don't really know, but you know straight away whether someone's going to make it or not, you know. No matter what trade they're in, you, you know in yeah. a month yeah. whether they're going to be any good or not, you know. That, you know, some people will never be any good, but they make it, so. Anyway, yeah. Who's some of the young fellas that you've you know helped guide and shape that oh, well, stand out for you over the yeah, forty we years? We had like a couple of really good motocross riders and road racers and you know and young Daniel Mettens, he's really good and Gavin was good. We had, we had a lot of people to come through the shop that were really good mm. um, in the sport. Good motocross riders, good road racers, you know. It was, yeah, we had. We was trying to work out the other day and you know. I, I'm not sure how many people I would have gone through, but yeah. we think it's probably over a hundred, I'd oh, say. Easy. Easy. Easy, yeah. yeah. But yeah, we've been lucky. <coughs> Most of our staff have been here a long time. Mm. What do you put that longevity down oh, to? Oh, my abuse, probably. <laughs> 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 well, that's, that's one thing, like, you know, um, uh, being an old school guy, and you know, I met you probably 10, 12 years ago, um, you're a straight shooter, you call it how you see it, and um, probably people respect that, and that's something that doesn't happen in I today's think, day and age. I think, Troy, it's something I think about a bit. <clears throat> Things have changed. A lot of my times we poke shit was not serious, but because <laughs> unfortunately a lot of people don't know whether you're serious or not, so you have to sometimes back off. Mm. In, in the old day, in the younger days, I mean, you could poke shit and not get into trouble for it. Now you can't do mm. that, you know. Good or bad, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the ins and outs of all that is, is being human beings, you know. And I, I don't think you should belittle anybody, or, or mm. really, if, unless they deserve it, and, you know. And so um, I think you've got to be careful, but yeah. It's just me, you can't change who you are, Troy. But I did a hell of a lot of stuff for people, young people, speedway people, go-karts for nothing. And because I loved them, you know, so I might have abused them, but I did it. It was all part of the love, part, part, of, part of the love, yeah, it was, you know, and so, yeah.